Hey everybody, have you ever thought about taking an online art class but had no idea what to expect? In this demo, I'll show you the type of things that you'll learn in all of my online classes. Let's watch. Okay, so I typically will start out by showing everyone the different mixes of colors that I'm going to be using. Okay, for every class, the, the materials list for my watercolor classes is pretty consistent. It does not change from class to class. I work with a very limited palette. I have ultramarine, Prussian blue, Windsor yellow, uh, raw sienna, Windsor red, and some alizarin crimson. Okay, so today, since we're working with greens, I always mix all my secondary colors. So my greens, purples, and oranges are always made up from this uh, set of, I've got two of each primary out here. Um, so since we're gonna be working with greens today, I'm going to use both blues and both yellows. Sometimes I just work with a triad of colors. I like to keep my palette limited because I think, you know, a lot of times people try to use too many colors and it gets overwhelming and then the colors start fighting with one another and um, you, know, you don't get as cohesive of an end result. Okay, so first I'm going to mix up a little bit of that Prussian blue and some of my Windsor yellow. Now that's going to give me a nice sort of a bright, intense, almost electric sort of a green, which is fine. I can definitely see some of that on the apple, right? Whenever I, when I start, I always like to get my palette mixed up first so that I can then focus on painting when I'm painting. Okay, so I've got my blue and my yellow, my Prussian blue and my Windsor yellow, and I've got that mixed up, that's going to give me a nice apple-y sort of a green. Now I'm going to want some other greens that are um, going to be a little bit more muted. So I'm going to stick with my Prussian blue for now. I'll put some of that over here. And then I'm going to take some raw sienna and I'm going to mix those two together. Now look at the difference in the type of green that we get when we use the raw sienna versus the um, Windsor yellow. It gets much more earthy, much more organic. organic. It's very um, sort of golden, okay? And so that is going to be a nice green maybe for some of these leaves, maybe in some of the shadow areas um, so that we can have some differentiation between those, those two different shades. Okay, that is the key when working with greens, really when working with any color, but particularly for greens, is to get a lot of variation in those, those greens. One of the problems I have with tube colors, it's not that working with a tube color is bad, but I find that a lot of people when they work with tube colors have a tendency to just say, okay, that's my green, take it out of the tube and use it. If you're going to use a tube color, modify it with some of your blues, some of your uh, yellows, so that it, it gets its own personality and just doesn't just look like, oh, I just squeezed this green out of the tube and wherever there's something green, that's what I'm going to use. Okay, I just mixed up another type of a green. I used the ultramarine and the Windsor yellow. Okay, that gives me a little bit more of a slightly more organic look, but not quite as dark and as um, muted as the Prussian blue and the raw sienna. It gives me more of like a grassy sort of a green. This is, this is the ultramarine and the Windsor yellow. That's really pretty if you're doing a landscape and you want a, uh, you know, maybe a sunlit grassy area. I'm gonna put a couple of little splotches down of these and later when I send you this, I'll tell you what they are. I'll actually write it on there. I always like to make up these little demo sheets. It's fun for me. Okay, and then we've got this third one. There we go. And then the last green that I'm going to make is I'm going to use some of my, some more of my ultramarine. And I'm going to put a little bit of raw sienna in with that. Now, what that's going to give me is a very grayish green, okay? Let's just move that over there. That's going to give me a nice sort of a gray green, almost like a eucalyptus or a cypress sort of a color. That's really nice for so to have some nice muted contrast with some of these really, really, really bright areas, okay? I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to put some yellow, some Windsor yellow right over here, and I'm going to pull a little bit of this green into it just so that I can have some more variation 
right? A lot of times when we want to make a lighter color, a lot of times people will just keep adding water to it. Try instead of making everything lighter, try to make things brighter as well. So if you pull in, and to do that, you just put in a lighter, one of your lighter, brighter mixes, like a yellow or a bright red, and that's going to do it. That's going to give you a really, really nice uh, burst of contrast. Okay, let me put this on here, so I, just so I don't forget, because I'm going to label those for you later on, and I'll send that to you. That's what I do in all of my demos. I label everything. I send you the demo painting. I send you the video so that you can go back and look at it as often as you want. Okay, now we're also going to have some, we've got the stem over there. We want to get some contrast in there. Everything in this painting is green. So I'm going to take a little bit of my raw sienna and a little bit of that Windsor red and make a nice sort of terracotta color. We can use that for the stems. We can put a little bit of that, I did like I did in this one, put a little bit of that in my background just to sort of connect things up, warm some things up on that surface there. Um, I'm also going to need a really, really dark dark. So for like all this stuff in, in there, I'm going to take some of my Prussian blue, which is the darkest color I have on this palette, and some of my alizarin. I'm going to mix those two together. And that's going to give me a really dark, dark purpley tone. It's almost black. If it looks too purpley to you, throw a little bit of raw sienna in with it. Not a lot, just a little bit. And what that'll do is that'll neutralize it even further and give you a really nice dark neutral. Okay? It's kind of nice for like some of these shadow areas and everything in here. You can see, look at how those darks back there really pop everything forward. Same with in this study of greens. We always, always, always need to have a range of values, okay, from your white of your paper all the way to your darkest dark. Okay, just want to get all of these nice little swatches on here so that I can label them later on, and I'll write down what colors I use to make all of those. Okay, so let's get this, let's get this thing started. All right, so we've got, um, we've got the pair. I'm going to get that blocked in. So I'm going to take a little bit of my uh, Prussian blue that I mixed up before with the raw sienna. I want to make a nice sort of a dark shadowy color. And then I'm also going to take a little bit of this brighter green that I had here. And I'm going to make the pair. I actually want to make the pair almost, almost as if it was yellow itself and then had some greenish tones in this shadow. So first thing I'm going to do, that pair is kind of an important player to me in this thing. I always say take your object that is kind of key, a key element in your composition, put it down on your paper where you want it and in the size that you want it. Okay, so nice big pair. I'm going to block that in. I'm going to just get all of my uh, light side blocked in. Doesn't matter if you do the light side or the dark side first. I know a lot of people who work in watercolor insist, insist, I never insist on anything, I just suggest, insist that you work from light to dark. I prefer to work either from middle to light to dark or middle to dark to light or sometimes to dark. Uh, so I start with my darks because if you start with your darks early on, you get your drawing, it, it just sort of shows itself. Your image shows itself more quickly. And if that happens, you get, what happens is you get a nice idea of your range of values, okay? And if you have your, you, if, you, if you've got a good range of values, you're going to have a successful drawing, okay? You're a successful painting. Um, if you don't get your darkest darks in there, which a lot of watercolors, a lot of watercolorists, what I notice when I look at watercolor paintings is a lot of the times people just never get quite dark enough, okay? And I think that comes from the fact that you're constantly, constantly being told, save your whites, save the lights, don't, don't get too dark. And then they never get dark enough, and that's why sometimes a watercolor painting will look washed out and flat, okay? I made sure I got really nice and dark on this left side of this pair. It might look a little too dark at the beginning, but you know what? Watercolor has a funny little habit that it does. It dries lighter, okay? You think that you got it in there and, oh yeah, it's, it's looking great. And then all of a sudden, wait, it's not dark enough. And so that's why 
the sooner you get those nice strong darks in there, the better. I'm going to just move this back a little so that everyone can see my, the, the whole drawing. Okay, got to get our shadows in there, right? Shadows, so important. They are what's going to ground the objects and make them look like they're actually sitting on a table as opposed to just floating on in front of the page, okay? The shadows are typically going to be darker, darkest, where they are closest to the object and then fade away as they, they move away from it. So always kind of try to see that and then block it in that way. If you're if you touch the wet area to the wet area, it might run a little bit on you, but you know what? This is a watercolor. Watercolor does that. Don't worry about it too much. Try not to go for a really, really hard edged look everywhere. You want some places where things are going to sort of disappear and reappear. When you're working with something like um, like that that's organic like fruit or whatever also try to remember to kind of square your edges off a little tiny bit um, fruit is not perfect if you make it too perfect and too rounded it will look like fake fruit okay so that's just a little tip for when you're working with uh, with fruit or any type of vegetable forms or whatever okay there we go I just want to get that shape of that in there a little bit better okay now we got to get our apple in there now I want the apple the apple is also green, but I want that apple to have a little bit more of a bluish tone to it, right? A little more apple greeny sort of a look. So I'm going to use some of my Prussian blue with the Windsor yellow, but I'm going to go a little heavier on the blue. Okay, I'm going to just start to block that in. This one I'll start from the shadow side so that you can see that I'm not making it up. <laughs> that you can go from the darker side into the lighter side. Okay, I said I wanted that to be bluer, but I don't want it to be aqua. So I just got to throw a little more yellow in there, and I can even get a little bit of some of my raw sienna in there. The reason raw sienna will tone down anything that looks too blue-green or that too sort of electric look to it is because raw sienna has a fair amount of red in it. Red and green are opposite one another on the color wheel. So what does it do? It neutralizes it and makes it look much more organic. Okay, there's the green I was trying to get before. Okay, so now we'll just continue. Remember I did the shadow side on this one first. I just wanna pull that around there a little bit. There we go. And again, I'm gonna square those edges off just a bit so it doesn't end up looking like a fake apple. I'm going to paint around my highlights, okay? I love it that the paint where it's meeting up with the shadow area there, it's still wet. That's going to give me a nice sort of uh, transition from light into dark, okay? And I can leave a little bit of some highlights just sort of around the ring there. And then later on, we're going to put in the little stem. But for now, let's just, just do that. Let's let it dry. Okay, so we've got the apple blocked in. And then you can see I've got two green objects, but this one is much more blue green and this one is much more golden green. That's because over here, I stayed mostly with the Prussian blue and the Windsor yellow instead of having that raw sienna in there. So again, that variety is what's gonna make it more interesting. Okay, we're gonna go back to our shadow color, which was the Prussian blue and the alizarin but I put, a, I put a fair amount of water in it for this part because I don't want this part to be as dark as some of the things in the background. Okay, what this is going to do is it's going to really start directing your eye and connecting these two objects that are on the table here so that you know where to look, okay? That's what composition is all about. It's about making connections, making things balanced, and telling your viewer where they need to look. Okay, so that's going to tie nicely into that. And now we've got all this area up here that we need to do something with that. Okay, so watch what happens when I start blocking in some shadow tone up here behind that pair. That starts to push it forward a little bit, right? That's what we want. We want to be able to really see that that, that pair is coming forward towards us, okay? So I'm going to start to put in a little bit more of that. And then up in here, I'm really going to get dark in a minute, okay? Because I really want that to, to start to pop. So I'm going to work quickly. I'm going to take some of that 
Prussian blue. I'm going to take some more of the alizarin and I'm going to mix up a nice, nice big batch of that dark neutral. I'm going to put some of the raw sienna in it just to keep it from getting too purpley. Okay, the reason the raw sienna works is remember, I treat my raw sienna as if it were a yellow, and so yellow and purple are opposite one another. I always go to the complement on the color wheel. And what that does is that allows me to really, uh, you know, have some nice unity and control. I'm going to put throw, throw some of that back behind the, uh, the apple there as well. And then we can just sort of hint at some of those sort of striations on the uh, plastic pot there. Let's just throw all of this, get it really nice and dark behind that so that it really starts to push things forward. Whenever you have something like this pot that's back there, that's, it's sort of a, you have to think of it kind of as a, in a supporting role and not be too literal about it, okay? So I am going to put in some of the, the leaves, right? We've got nice leaves up there from that plant. The plant, though, and the pot are really kind of like some support material that is there really just to kind of direct your eye where to look, lead you around the composition a little bit. It's, it's not something you really want to compete with your subject, okay? So I always try to keep those things that I consider to be sort of in the background or on the periphery. I look at what's there and I use it as a starting point to suggest what's going on in the background but I don't want to put as much uh, developed detail or anything on those areas because if I start getting really, really intense with what I'm putting down in these areas that are um, away from my subject, I'm gonna take your eye and I'm gonna direct you away from it. And I don't wanna do that. So I like to keep these things a little bit more just barely there, sort of just suggestions of what's going on and I even just kind of throw a little bit of water on stuff and just sort of use that to, to kind of bring us throughout the composition, okay? All right, so let's get just a little bit more of some of these leaves that I've got in there. I love this, this plant. I always like working with things that are like flowers and uh, plants. When you do that, you can be very free with where you put things. Uh, if you need, I wanted to have some greenery down on the side here to sort of balance all of that out. So there's no leaf on there in, in the real thing, but that doesn't matter. You can easily move them. Flowers don't mind if you move them around. You can always, always go by what you need for your composition versus what's really, really there. Okay, that's, that's kind of my philosophy, really, no matter what the subject is. And it's just that it's a little easier to do that with something like this that's, you know, kind of organic and, and not uh, like an urban landscape or something like that. Okay, so we've, we've got to get a little bit more warmth in some of these areas. So I'm going to take a little of that raw sienna and um, Windsor Red that I mixed up, take, make a little bit more of it. Okay, I want to get some of that even let it have a little bit more of a reddish tone. Why not? That'll be kind of fun. Um, I just want to get a little bit of that in some of these background areas, just so there's not so much just white of the paper. Okay, it'll just, it, it, it'll warm things up a bit because it's a very cool tone painting. You can even imply a little bit of some creases or something on a uh, tablecloth, whatever you, you want to have in there, just so that it's not just a blank area, right? Because there was quite a bit of, of empty space up in there. Okay, I want to just smooth this edge out a little bit. Not everything needs to be hard edged. We always remember that you want to have both a combination of soft and hard edged areas. Now we need to get the stem on the apple. So we'll just put that right in here. I purposely waited to do that until it was dry and get a little darker on this part and that'll make it feel like it really kind of goes into that that well that we have there. And then we can take a little of the darker green and just put some of that over here and even just make that little, nice little shadow. That always tells me when, so when people put things like that in, that always tells me, oh yeah, they were really looking at what was going on with the light and everything on their painting. That, that says a lot to me. It, it, it kind of just kicks it up to the next level. Okay, I wanna get a little darker right in here. Also want to get, look at how light these dried, these shadows I placed underneath, 
right? Remember what I said, where it's closest to the object, you need to get really nice and dark and then let it fade out as it moves away from it. Okay, so there we go. So now that's, that's going to take care of that. We are so close to being done with this. I always like to just sort of step back a bit, take stock of what I've got. You always, always, I always highly recommend that you stop sooner rather than later. We can put a little shadow over here to just sort of imply that that's underneath those leaves, something like that, so that it looks like it's maybe coming off. And that'll also give us the opportunity to darken up a little bit right behind the apple and push that forward a little more. Okay, we wanna make sure everything seems nice and connected. And then sometimes it's always, always kind of fun <laughs> excuse me, to just get a little bit of some playfulness into it with a tiny bit of some splatter. You don't always have to do that. I don't always do it. Don't rely on it. But sometimes if you want some random little warm spots or something in there, I just took some more of the raw sienna and some of the um, Windsor Red and I just throw a little bit of this. The reason that this works as a unifier, if you've ever done that before, is it allows you to readily just sort of be random with your placement. If you tried to just go dot, 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 and like get it to look random, odds are it wouldn't. It probably looked like you went dot, 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 and you know, we're intentional about it. You can leave some of them just as little splatters. You can spread some of them around. It just kind of gives you an opportunity you know, to give it a little bit more of a slightly oh, carefree, festive sort of an air to it. I always like my paintings to have that. Okay, so there we go. I think I am almost ready to call this done. Oh, I know there's one other thing that I can show you that's always kind of worth doing. If you want to, uh, let's say that you've got some areas that you really just want to get a little bit, a little tiny bit more dark into them and you don't want to do it with your brush, you can always take a, um, a fine point pen. You can do it in any color that you want to. I usually will just do it in black. I thought I had one out here. Oh, well, maybe I don't. Well, anyway. Oh, here it is. Okay. You can always take a bit of a fine point pen. You don't what you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to outline everything and like draw hard lines around it because then you'll get a coloring book look. But you can certainly go in, you can make a few little lines that will just for emphasis kind of give your eye a, a um, sort of a visual path to follow of darks. That's going to help lead you through your composition. Okay, so, so that's the demo painting and I will send you a copy of this later on so that you can see it and, um, and then after I'm done with the quick little one that I'm going to do in pastel, I'll put everybody back on, take you off mute, and you can ask some questions. Okay, so that was watercolor. I hope you enjoyed the demo. I do a demo just like this in every class, and what's even better is I record it and share it with the group afterwards so that you can watch as many times as you want whenever it's convenient. If this sounds like something that would be of interest to you, head over to my website, cooloff.com, to see all the classes that I have lined up. I can promise you two things. If you take a class with me, you'll learn a lot and you'll have lots of fun.